Hi, I'm John Little, and you're watching the Introduction to ggplot, Introduction to R learning series. This learning series is sponsored by the Center for Data and Visualization Sciences, part of the Duke University Libraries. In this part two of this two-part section, we're going to focus on ggplot and visualization. We'll learn about the grammar of graphics, the ggplot code template for making a visualization, and then we'll learn about some of the various features and arguments and functions that we can use to visualize data. So let's get started. Starting off at our workshop series, uh, this is part two of the Quick Start with R, or is a introduction to the visualization of ggplot. You can find this guide from either one of these, uh, but also at GitHub. And specifically, we're going to use, I'm going to use this um, code right here, ggplot underscore quick dot rdm. I'm actually going to start with the HTML rendered report because it's a little easier to do the explanation, but you can get the code from this link right here and try it yourself on your machine. All right, we're going to load the tidyverse meta package of eight tidyverse packages that includes ggplot. It's also going to include forecats and deplier. Those are useful. More information about those there. So gg in ggplot stands for grammar of graphics. This is a concept that was championed and developed by Hadley Wickham. There's a basic template that you can use to generate any ggplot plot. It looks like this. So you would say ggplot is a function, and you would say data equals, and you would give it a data frame. And then you can map aesthetics, so mapping equals AES for aesthetics. And inside the aesthetics function, you need to map usually x equals to some variable in the data frame y equals to some variable in a data frame. Then you have a conjunction, and then, and then you visualize a layer using one of the many geometric function layers. All of that we're going to talk about in detail. This is the formal template. In practice, we tend to use, since we're doing tidyverse, we tend to use a template that looks like this. So we'll take the data frame, then put in a pipe that we can think of as saying and then. So data frame and then ggplot. Aesthetics, we don't have to use all of the formal arguments, we can just identify the x variable and the y variable and the aesthetics and then give it a geometric function. So for this workshop, let's just use as a goal that we're going to try and create a scatter plot of mass over height uh, or the relationship between mass and height for characters in the Star Wars data set, which is on board data set, part of the deplier package. The other part of our goal is to simply draw a regression line, as you can see. The Star Wars data set looks like this. You can scroll right and scroll left. You can scroll up and down. But basically, it's characters in Star Wars films, and uh, data variables that we're interested in include mass and height. So we're going to visualize that. Now, to create or initiate a ggplot plot, we start by identifying the data frame, Star Wars, and then send that to ggplot. And what we'll get is a gray box. So it kind of feels like we didn't do much, but that's the initial step. No one ever just stops here, of course, so let's just keep on going. All right. In our case, I'm actually going to filter out one of the, um, I'm going to filter out the heaviest character, which is Jabba the Hutt, who weighs a couple thousand, or more than a thousand kilograms. Um, let's just filter him out because it'll make it a little bit easier to look at the results. So we're going to use standard deplier data manipulation, Star Wars, and then filter where mass is less than 500 kilograms, and then paste all of that or pipe all that to ggplot and assign the x-axis to height and the y-axis to mass. Right? When we do all that, ggplot will draw the basic grid for us. They'll put in some grid lines, they'll put in the tick marks that related to the data variables that we have, mass and height, uh, but we still haven't visualized the data because we need to do one more step, which is to visualize a layer. Visualizing layers is usually done with geometric functions. I'll talk about those more in detail, but in this case, the geometric function is geom point, which makes a scatter plot. Okay, so up until this point, everything's the same, and then geom point, and that gives us this basic scatter plot. All right, now I'd like to point out some of the argument characteristics that we have with ggplot. One is mapping aesthetics. Typically, as in up here, you'll map aesthetics in the global variable that's done up at the ggplot function, but you can assign local aesthetics and, and arguments in each layer. Uh, if you assign them globally, they carry through or are accessible to all of the layers. If you assign them or set them in a, in a geometric function, they're available only to that function. So in this case, what's available 
to all of the ggplot future layers is a data frame, a data frame that's been limited to characters with mass below, less than 500 kilograms. And then we get the exact same plot as above by mapping the aesthetics inside the geom point layer as opposed to inside the ggplot layer. Looks the same. But that the ability to move those mappings around comes in handy. All right, so what are mappings? Well, you've got a sense of that already. We mapped X and Y, but you can map other visual characteristics like color, fill, which is, a, which is another color argument, line type, if you're doing lines, do you want a dashed line or a solid line? How wide do you want the line to be? Opacity, which is set with an argument called alpha. Shape, so if you're doing scatter plots, do you want circles? Do you want circles that can be filled in? Do you want squares or plus marks or X marks? Um, there are actually many different kinds of aesthetic arguments that you can set, and they're usually unique to each geometric function. So you can always go back and check the help documentation for which arguments you can use. All right, in this case, we're going to start with color. So up until this point is the same as everything we've seen before. I added in a um, comment to reflect the more formal argument assignment, but this is the actual argument, and we're adding in color equals gender. Gender is another variable in the data frame. If we scroll up real quickly, I'll scroll to the right, there you can see we have both a sex variable and a gender variable. In this case, gender is listed as masculine or feminine or not listed. And so we assigned color to gender, and ggplot then automatically colored the points and automatically drew a legend, automatically labeled the legend, and uh, you can see the results here. So the feminine characters are listed as kind of a red-pink, and the masculine characters are listed as a teal blue. So, so far, we've been mapping aesthetics. That is, assigning some data characteristic to the data values based on a data variable. If the data variable was feminine, ggplot took care of us choosing a color, but it consistently applied that color all the feminine points on the plot. Same is true for masculine. You can also, rather than map these characteristics, you can set them manually to choose or override a different kind of characteristic. So in this case, outside of the aesthetic function, right, mapping takes place inside of the aesthetic. Outside of the aesthetic function, I use the same argument, color, and I assign it specifically to a chosen color or a, a color option that works in ggplot. There are many color options, we'll talk about those in a minute. In this case, I chose the, col the goldenrod option. And you'll see that here, all the points have been changed, into the changed to this gold yellow color, goldenrod, whereas the default was to have them represented as black. All right, so that was all done in the basic template, mapping or setting aesthetics to a particular geometric function called geom point. There are lots of geom functions. Some of the more common ones are now listed on your screen. So if you want to do a bar graph, you could use either geom bar or geom call. The difference is that geom bar will calculate the row totals for you, whereas geom call Typically, if you have row totals that need to be calculated, after you calculate them, you'll use geom call. You can check the documentation. Geom histogram is useful for showing uh, data frequency distributions. Scatter plots, we already learned the one, geom point. There's another one called geom jitter, which is used for overplotting. You can make a line graph with geom line. You can make a box plot, geom box plot. If you click on this link right here, you'll get to the ggplot documentation, specifically to the geom section. You can see a listing of all of the various geoms. And if you drill down on any one of those, for example, if we click on geom point, we can get documentation for geom point. And here's a listing of the aesthetics that can be mapped or set. Okay, so just like we could take a data, transform data frame and visualize it with geom point, we can do something similar and visualize it with geom box plot. So in this case, I'm doing something special in this line to limit the number of box plots, box plots I see. But I've got box plots for the various species in the Star Wars data set. Uh, the box represents the interquartile range, or the middle 50%. The line in the box represents the median, so half of the, half of the characters are above that line, half of the characters are below. The line leading out of the top of the box is the um, last quarter and the line leading out of the beginning of the box is the first quarter of the data. And then the dots are the outliers. Um, a line graph can be drawn similarly uh, with geom line. Okay? You could combine geom line and geom point. We'll get to that in a second. Let's talk real briefly about overplotting. Overplotting is a 
In the case of a, of a scatter plot, you'd have multiple points sitting on top of each other and you wouldn't be able to distinguish how many points are sitting in that one spot. Um, there's two ways to handle that. You can either change the opacity or you can use something called geom jitter. So a change in the opacity is simply an argument, alpha. In this case, I'm setting alpha to 30%. And then what I've got here is the more points in the data that are in that same spot will show up on top of each other, making the point darker, meaning there are multiple points right here, several points overlapping right there, couple points overlapping right there. So that's one way to deal with overplotting. Another way to visualize overplotting is to simply use the geom jitter function. And that'll push the data points, repel the data points away from sitting on top of each other, which will give you a cluster sense that there are multiple points there. It won't alter the data itself in the data frame, so you can continue to keep your data pristine, You're just visualizing and representing that overplotting in a special way. All right, let's talk about layers. We've alluded to layers so far. All of the plots we've done so far, I believe, are a single layer where we use the ggplot conjunction and then we use one layer, in this case geomjitter. But we could use two layers. Now, this plot's a little more complicated, um, but let's just draw out the highlights of this. There are two layers here. One's a geom line and one's a geom point. So in the global aesthetic argument, I'm mapping the x variable to year, so it's a time series plot, and I'm, maxing, I'm mapping the y variable to prop, or the prop variable. So this is the proportion of names, and actually somewhere else filtered the names down to just two, John and Elizabeth. Then in geomline, mapping color to sex, right? So I've got male names and female names. So this first part of the plot would give me the, green, the blue line and the pink line. And then add another layer, a point layer, where I set the shape of the points to crosses. So that's where these little X marks show up. And I set the opacity, or the alpha argument, to 40%. And that's why they appear as gray rather than black, because they're partially see-through. Now, if you want to see the whole code for that, it's right there. You can run it on your machine. But remember, now that we know all those basic steps, how to map aesthetics, how to set aesthetics, how to pipe in your data, how to pipe to multiple layers, how to use the global or the local settings, our goal was to create a scatter plot that showed the relationship of mass to height, which we've got here, and that also drew a regression line. So that's just one more layer, a layer called geom smooth, draws this blue line. It uses the formula that's identified in X and Y up here, right? So it's doing a linear regression or a linear model. That's the method. And the linear model wants to know what the response variable is and what the predictor variable are. So the response variable would typically be the Y variable, and the predictor variable would typically be the X variable. And since we already have identified those here, here in ggplot, it simply picks up on that. The formula doesn't have to be represented again because it knows what to do with that x and y. In this case, we're identifying the linear regression model and we're setting the confidence interval or the standard error to false. So that part's not represented on the screen, the standard error. And as a result of geom smooth, we get this blue line showing the basic prediction of height to mass. This would be a good time to stop. You could do some practice sessions, and this would be a great place to go to, for example, our studio primers and practice some of the visualization exercises. So let's talk about what we can do with geom bar, yet another geometric function. In geom bar, we're taking a new data set, part of the ggplot package, MS sleep, which calculates the sleep of various animals, be they carnivores, herbivores, insectivores, or omnivores. And so what we're doing is we're piping that data set to ggplot. We're mapping the variable vor, that's carny, herby, insecti, and omni, to the x variable. And in the case of geom bar, we only need that x variable because the y variable, in this case, is going to be a count of how many of each of those categories there are. And that's what geom bar does, is it will count the rows and then give you a bar total. So we know that herbivores are the most popular at slightly over 30, and we know that insectivores are the least popular as looks at roughly about five. Now this is, plot is good enough, but what we want to do is learn about arranging. In order to learn about arranging, we're going to bring in another tidyverse package, a package called 4Cats. What 4Cats does is it enables you to manipulate your character variables as if they were factors or as if they were categorical. And the reason why we want to do that is because it makes it simpler to arrange these bars in order. And what we want is we want to arrange them in descending order because it will be easier for people to interpret the results, right? So we're using the 4Cats 
Cats library to invoke a function in 4Cats called fct underscore infreq, which you see right here. And what that does is it will enable us to easily order the bars by their frequency. And then it becomes easier to tell that there's a difference between omnivores and carnivores. So nothing about this particular plot changed except that I used the fct underscore infreq in frequency function inside of the aesthetic function to transform the bore variable to a categorical factor and then present that in category in the frequency order. That's what the fact frequent does. There are several four cats functions. They all do different things and allow you to manipulate manipulate categorical or factor data. We've now got several pieces of of the grammar that we can understand, and we can develop a slightly more sophisticated graph. So in this case, it's a two-layer graph. We're going to present, we're going to map eye color in frequency, and you'll notice I pulled out another 4Cats function here, fct underscore rev, which reverses the order of the bars. And I'm doing that because down here, the last thing I did is a chord flip. I flipped the x-axis to the y-axis. I think actually um, now with ggplot3, I could have just said, y equals i color. But um, in any case, it's good to know about chord flip because sometimes you want to flip the axes and that's a nice easy way to do it. But since I flipped the axes, I had to reverse the order of the sorted order of the factor variable. So after I generated a reverse order, sorted order factor of the i color variable, I'm going to visualize all of it in gray and you'll see that all except for this one. But there's actually a layer below this orange that is a gray bar that fits perfectly underneath it. And then I'm going to do another layer, also a geom bar function, and I'm going to identify a new data frame. And in this data frame, I'm going to use some deplier functions to limit my data set to only that part of the data frame where the eye color variable has a value of orange. Okay, if you need to know more about deplier, you can watch part one of the quick start video, or you can watch the deplier video. So I've subset the data of Star Wars, the same Star Wars data, but in this case I've subset it just to where eye color equals orange. And that's going to be roughly, I think, eight rows. And then I've set the fill to a color called dark orange. One thing to note here is that we've now used things like color in some cases and fill in other cases. Fill is usually the interior color, and color is typically the border around objects that accept a fill argument. In the scatter plot, it only accepted a color argument for the shape that we used. There are other shapes, there are other circles that have a fill and a color. The shapes we use, the default shapes, didn't accept both of those arguments. But just know that there's a difference between fill and color. If you play with it, you'll see how they're different. Another advanced thing that we can do is we can use facet wrap. There are two really nice functions called facet wrap and facet grid. In the case of facet wrap, what we're doing, we're doing this, a standard scatter plot that we had done before, uh, but then we're fastening by a different variable called class. So two-seaters, compact, mid-sized cars, subcompact cars, pickups, minivans, and SUVs. And what it does is it generates a subplot for each one of those categories. And it makes it a little easier to see the trend within each one of those subcategories. All right, let's talk about scales. Scales are used to affect the visual qualities of the data. Uh, so I'm going to introduce color first. It's, I think, the easiest way to understand skill, scales, but you can use scales for other reasons, and I have a second example. Let's say, for example, we have um, a, cat, uh, a variable in our MS sleep data frame called conservation, and conservation is a category about which we're concerned of each one of the animals. In this case, conservation has things that are endangered, things that are of least concern, animals that are domesticated, those kinds of things. We'll fill that out later. I can set subparts of the bar by filling in using G on call with the conservation variable. Now my point is, what I want to talk about scales, is I filled these colors in with the fill argument, mapping the fill argument aesthetic to conservation. If I don't do anything at all, ggplot will choose colors for me. But there are other ways to manipulate that color, and we manipulate that color with scales. So in this case, we're going to find the appropriate scale fill function. Since we used fill here, we're going to use scale underscore fill here. If we had used color up here, we would use scale underscore color there. All right? Well, we used fill. So scale fill underscore, and then we're going to use the viridis library. And this, in this case, the function is viridis underscore d for discrete. 
think if you click on this link right here, you can see all of the various ways that we can use scale. And you'll see that scale Viridis has D for discrete, C for continuous, and B for bend. So we're using D for discrete because it's a categorical variable. And we're setting a particular value for the gray and A category. But other than that, Viridis chose a vibrant set of colors, easy to perceive, and can be printed to black and white printers and still be easy to perceive. Viridis has other palettes, but this is the default palette. It works quite well. If I wanted to use a different color palette, I can. I have color palette options. But again, it's all about using scale. So I'm mapping scale underscore fill, or I'm associating scale underscore fill with this fill argument that's mapped in this geometric function. So for example, other than Viridis, I could use the uh, Color Brewer library. So the same fill mapping that takes place here. But in this case, I'm going to use scale underscore fill underscore brewer. And because I know that this is qualitative data, I'm setting the type to qual, and I'm still setting the gray. And what happened was Brewer chose the default palette, a default qualitative palette, and I get a different range of colors here to represent uh, the differences in conservation time. Okay, I could also use an argument such as palette equals dark two. Come back to that in just a minute. Yet another way to manage color is to manage color manually. Okay, so if you want to pick your own colors, uh, you can, just like we were using scale underscore fill underscore Viridis, or scale underscore fill underscore color brewer, we can use scale underscore fill underscore manual. So here I have set character vector of, color, of colors, and the first argument under scale underscore fill underscore manual is values. And the values needs to take color names or hex numbers. So for example, if I search um, hex color for dark orange, there's the hex value or the RGB value. You can use those arguments as well, but sometimes the names are easiest. So values equals my color vector, and I'm still setting my grays for NA. Now I have yet a different customized set of fill colors. All right, I spoke up here about the fact that I could use different color brewer palettes and that one way I could use do this is by using an argument palette equals dark two. But you might want to know, well, what are the colors that I can use? So a simple way to do this is to go to Google or whatever search engine you want and just put in the phrase are color names. And usually the first two or three options that come back are all useful in showing you a range of options and giving you color names. A specific way to do this with Color Brewer, once you load the Color Brewer, the R Color Brewer library, you can call the function display brewer all, display.brewer.all, and it will draw this little palette option for you, and you can see the qualitative variable color palettes, the diverging color palettes, and the divert um, ascending color palettes. You can use all of these codes as you like, such as palette equals dark two, or palette equals set one or palette equals BUPU for blue-purple. Another way to use scales is that you can use scales to change the scales that you see on the outside of the graph. And it's very common in data science to use a logarithmic scale to tease out part of the data story that is harder to realize on a standard scale, right? So if we use the chicken weight data, we can, use, we can draw a line plot time series of the diets being fed, um, so the weight as a response variable to time, uh, based on diets that are being fed to various animals, right? Uh, but if you look at this data in a data frame, and you can use a geom histogram to view this data, you'll see that the data are right skewed. And because they're right skewed, the data story is a little bit harder to present in a visualization. So it's very common in a case like that, in case of skewed data, to present the data over a logarithmic scale. And so one of the scale options is scale underscore y underscore log 10. And that simply changes the y axis to a log logarithmic scale. And if you look at these two variables together, these two plots together, what you see is a slightly different data story. Indeed, it's clear here that there's a leveling off of the diets after a certain amount of time versus here, where it looks like the diet gets better almost exponentially over time, uh, which is not actually true. So that's a scale, another scale option. So what scale allows you to do, set allows you to manipulate color, allows you to manipulate how the data are presented along the scale, but it's ways to present visually the data that you have in your data frame. Now, this is another place, a good place to stop, perhaps. Um, there's a good set of exercises that you can look at in the ggplot workshop that I have. Uh, if you go back to the guide 
There's a good set of exercises. A former colleague of mine, she's created a whole series of ggplot exercises that are nice to work through and they all have answers. Or you can also continue to work your way through the R primer series. But I'll just say that this is a good place to stop before I go on to labels. Okay, this last section I'm not going to narrate quite as much, but let's just uh, run through this. There are other things that you want to manipulate about your graph. For example, the labels, you might want to change your x, your x axis label, your y axis label. You might want to give a title or a uh, subtitle or have a caption or change the title to your legend title. You can do all of that with the labs argument, which you can see right here and it's pretty self explanatory Labels are a specialized part of the scales function. Themes, on the other hand, are typically not data related. They're, they have more to do with the style of the plot that you're developing and the fact that you can quickly change a theme from one style to another. So you see here, built into ggplot2, several classic themes that you can choose just by using theme underscore classic versus theme underscore dark. Let's take a look at a couple of those. So here is our plot just plotted with theme underscore dark. You'll notice that we started with the phrase plot underscore sleep. That's because you can assign all ggplot arguments to an object name and the result will be accessible as this object plot underscore sleep. So then if I want to change underscore sleep by theme, I can apply all kinds of ggplot functions to plot underscore sleep, not just themes. But here's a way that I can quickly change the default plot to theme dark, or quickly change it to theme underscore classic, or I really like these HBR themes, and one that I like in particular is the theme Ipsum, which chooses this color palette, and you'll notice a couple other things worth noting is that it comes some, with some of its own scale options, so I'm using uh, scale fill underscore Ipsum to uh, also change the values of the variables in the legend. You can see that happens right there. Uh, and then one of the things that's new, so in then, one of the things that's new with ggplot3 is that I have an argument called plot.title.position, which is part of theme, and that allows me to move the title all the way over to left justified as opposed to plot justified. Uh, and other things that you can change with theme are things like uh, the grid lines. Okay, some other really cool things. Uh, there's a package called Patchwork, which allows you to combine plots together. Uh, it's dead simple by a really interesting developer, Thomas Lynn Peterson. And so after you load the library, you can use the you can use the slash or the or the pipe, depending on whether you want you want the plot objects to be side by side or one over the other. In the case of the slash, it's one over the other, and that puts both of these objects one over the other into a single image. Uh, if you want to do interactive plots, a really nice way to do that is to take your ggplot object and use the function plotly function from the plotly library, ggplotly. And that will take this, this uh, bar graph looks similar to stuff that we've already worked with, but whereas graphs like this don't have any interactivity, this graph does. So I can get flyout windows on this bar graph. I can click and drag to zoom in to a particular part of gra bar graph, or if I want to see really closely, like what is that green thing that I couldn't see before. If you double click, it'll zoom back out. By default, it'll give you this toolbar. You can turn it off if you want to. And then some people really like animations. Animations are something that I would caution you about. You, it's great power, but you should use the power judiciously. But once you decide that you are going to map something, animate something, the GG animate package, uh, which will take some time to get used to, will generate moving aspects to your visualization. So that's everything I wanted to tell you about ggplot. Thank you for listening. Feel free to have a look at these further resources. See you at the next Firefly Morning session.